Hello and welcome to another episode of the First Time Founders Podcast, the show where we talk about how to start a business from nothing and grow it into something meaningful. I'm Rob Lydiard. I'm a professional implementer of the Entrepreneurial Operating System, or EOS, which means I work with entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial leadership teams to help them get more of what they want from their businesses. So that's what I do as a day job, but in my spare time, I love talking to entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial people about the first time founder journey, what those of us that have done it learned upon the way, so that hopefully we can share some of those experiences, our war stories, and maybe save those coming behind us from making the very same mistakes that we did. So you can make your own mistakes if you're listening to this content. Today, I'm speaking to Steve Peralta, who's a co-founder and chief wellbeing officer at Unmind, which is a VC-backed high growth um, SaaS platform that delivers corporate well-being initiatives to individuals and teams. He's an amazing guy, fascinating background, um, started his career as a performer, then ended up a kind of well-being mental health coach um, before pairing up with a uh, an industry leading mental health professional and scientist from the NHS, Dr. Nick Taylor, to create Unmind. In this episode, Steve shares what he's learned about sustaining high performance through personal care, mental health uh, practices, and also what he's learned about configuring and coaching great teams to create environments that are conducive to high performance. So you can listen and get a lot from this as a founder on multiple levels. So without further ado, I give you Steve Peralta of Unmind. Steve, welcome to the First Time Founders Podcast. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Rob. Good to be here. So, Steve, we're going to dive deep into <laughs> mental health, drivers of, of, of mental well-being to make startups, the first time founder journey more sustainable. So I'm really excited about this. Before we get into it, would you mind giving folks a sense of who you are, where you come from, what you do at Unmind? Yeah, sure. So I am Steve Peralta. My role at Unmind is co-founder and chief well-being officer. Um, so we can chat about a bit more about that in a bit. Prior to Unmind, I was working as a well-being consultant and coach. So I did that for a, for a few years. Um, I coached executives before that around stress management and performance. And then prior to that, for about seven years, I was a singer and an actor and a musician and a performer. So I've had a quite a, a non-traditional journey towards what I'm doing today. That that's amazing. So what 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 drove that transition from performing to being interested in mm. the art and science of mental health and well-being? Sure. So I had about a seven-year career in in the entertainment industry. I loved elements of it. It also brought with it a I guess a dark side, and it it, it reignited old habits from my from my youth. Um, so it wasn't necessarily good for me the industry, but also where 2008 2009 with the with, with the crash and, and then entertainment became like a luxury that people didn't want to pay as much money for anymore and so i i decided to sort of because of both hitting rock bottom and it not necessarily feeling like a viable way forward i i didn't quite leave the industry i got a role as a singer on a cruise ship for a year and a half oh, wow. and so i had to, i had time to reflect and think and while i was there i realized that i as much as i loved music i wanted to well during that time i became really interested in, in spirituality, philosophy, psychology, well-being, et cetera, et cetera. And I sort of transformed my own well-being. And so I became interested in the idea of me potentially helping people to do the same. And that ignited, I guess, an, a, a pivot to my career path. And then I, I, that took me down the well-being route. And there's more to it, but that's effectively it. And, and you've built a, a pretty sizable business in this space, haven't you? You want to tell people a little bit about oh. mind? Yeah, for sure. So um, I was in my corporate well-being journey. Um, it was a, I had a conversation with my stepbrother, not my stepbrother, my brother-in-law at, uh, at one point about how I can reach more people doing what I was doing because I was doing a lot of face-to-face stuff. Um, and he had mentioned, you know, the digital tech avenue. Um, I'm not a techie at all, but at the time it, it was intriguing. And I had a, a business partner who was an ex-oil trader and he decided, let's go 50-50 in, in, in an idea. Let's see what we can do with it. And so we hired a few developers. And I worked in an idea called Illuminate Wellness, which was an idea of mine. It was a financial well-being, emotional well-being, and physical well-being platform. And the idea was that you could sort of uh, sort of evolve over time and, and get stages of, of well-being across these different um, 
areas of your life and it was integrated, etc. It was more in hindsight, it was a testing ground for ideas. Didn't really know what I was doing, um, <laughs> but, but it was it was it was cool to to figure out some ideas and put them to put them sort of bring them to life. Anyway, during that time, my business partner connected me with a guy called Dr. Nick Taylor, um, who at the time was in the NHS as a lead clinical psychologist. Um, and we had a chat and I remember telling him about what I was doing and what was important to me. So he was still in the NHS, but he was speaking about the opportunity within mental health and people weren't getting the right support at the right time. And we came at the problem from different perspectives him from a clinical problems focused perspective, mine from like a coaching, flourishing, expressing potential in life kind of perspective, which today sort of makes up our company. But anyway, we we, we hit it off and decided there was something there to worth working on, right? And that was uh, late 2015 or early 2016. Many Skype calls back and forth. I was living in Cape Town at the time. Um, and we got to the point where we decided to do something with this and, and hence Unmind. And we brought on two other co-founders at the time because Nick and I had not come from a entrepreneurial background and we didn't have tech experience. So we brought in a CTO and a CPO. Um, and then it's been a pretty interesting journey since then, the past eight years. Um, but yeah, today we are about 180 employees, um, global organization, an office in I headquarters in London, we've got one in New York and one in Sydney. And it's been a massive just learning journey for me, but it's one I've been very inspired by. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a, it's a great story. And what exactly does the product do? I mean, I know you're not selling the product, yeah. but just so that people can picture oh. as we now go on to talk about founder yeah. well-being. Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, at its heart, it is a product and offering that helps employees to become healthier at work, mentally healthy at work. It helps organizations to become sustainably high performing, right? And it's a, it's a win-win for both. But it's a it's a platform and an app. Um, in the beginning, it was very employee-centric. So we helped the employees to understand their mental health and then take proactive care of their mental health through learning development programs and bite-sized tools, all that kind of thing. Um, we acquired a, a coaching and therapy company about a, a year and a bit ago. So we have online therapy and coaching for employees as well, a mood tracker, assessment so that's covered but then about a few years ago we just recognized that look employ supporting employees is is important but that's not enough you could support your employees as much as you want in a toxic culture and you're still going to have problems (laughs) so we 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 moved from like just focusing on the person to the whole organization as well and so we help organizations understand their culture and the degree to which their culture and ways of leading and managing, et cetera, are supportive of mental health and well-being or not. And then we help them with their well-being strategy around that. And we do manager training and we work with their execs, um, integrate AI coaching into that as well. So it's quite, it's become a very comprehensive, holistic offering now. But at its heart, it's creating more mentally healthy, sustainably high-performing organizations and employees. That's amazing. Um, okay, so my interest in this in this topic, yeah. there's a few different bases. So, one, I um, founded m- my software company Yapster in 2015. Pr- prior to that, I was a corporate lawyer for a few years and then like a biz dev guy. So mm-hmm. I did stressful roles, but it never went. To, the stress never went to the core of like who I am. Right? I didn't didn't make me. They, neither of those jobs made me feel bad about myself. Sure. <laughs> Anyone that listens to this will know that Yapsa had a happy outcome in the end, but at the very like lowest points of it. I mean, at one point, actually, Steve, I haven't told you this when we were speaking before the, the call, but like the skin pigment in my forehead <laughs> went. Like I ended up, wow. like, I, I ended up with like um, it was. It, it has to be stress induced, right? Because it, because it, it, it sort of came. It, it came at the lowest point, which was lasted a year or two. And it's kind of faded as my as my life has got sure. smoother <laughs> and better over time. But it was really um, at the darkest points of the Yapster journey, that sort of stubborn first time founder journey when you're plowing on. It was the first time in my life where I'd ever experienced that my physical and mental <clears> health <throat> might break down before my willpower or cash ran out. Does that make sense? Mm. So like I was of kind course. of still able to go, of course. but like bits were falling off the boat. Um how often do you see that in and around the founder community? And like, are there any kind of 
oh, like, are there any like high level principles of well being that you typically would suggest mm. that a new founder look into first as they're going on the journey and starting to experience some of the symptoms of stress? Yeah, I mean, I think it's. Yeah, you know, thanks for sharing that. I mean, and, and I, I mean, stress manifests in such strange ways and in different ways across all of us, but definitely sounds related to that. And I think it's common, not necessarily the head rash, but <laughs> it's a <laughs> stress is and strain is and, and burnout is common amongst founders. We know that the research supports that um, hypothesis. And it is so important that as a founder, you stay healthy and well as as much as you're able to you know like I, i've learned over the years that feeling inspired feeling energized as a founder is critical um critical for your capacity to be high performing in a sustainable way right is that but also critical in terms of the role that you play within your company and the and the ripple effect that has outwards on the people around you like if you are feeling burnt out and and super stressed out you become that like match that then lights all the other matches around you kind of thing like it's you have such an outsized influence right so like it's just so important and it's difficult i guess i was lucky in that i came from a background of well-being and so i understood what it took for me to stay healthy and well um however there have been periods in my journey where that was difficult because of various circumstances that we, we might all encounter as a founder. But I've always, most of the time, been able to course correct relatively quickly by just, you know, listening to my body, listening to my mind. And I can tell you what I would do, but, you know. Please, please. that was what I was going to say. Like, I, um, what are those sort of fundamentals that you keep coming back to or that you knew coming into the journey that you think has, it hasn't clearly hasn't saved you from some of the strains and stresses that yeah. being a founder yeah. br naturally brings, but it sounds like it, uh, it equipped you better to, to deal with it. What are some of those fundamentals that for sure. for you? For sure. I would break them down to four groups. So fulfillment slash happiness. And I can chat what that means, what that means and what, what I do to, ensure that that is addressed and maintained. Um, let's call it recovery restoration, group, group two. And this is an order of priority. Um, then movement and then nutrition, hydration, et cetera. So, and, and I think if you're going to prioritize an order, that's, that's the order you go. So the first, like fulfillment and well-being, this is about, to me, it, it's central being clear on what your core values are as a, as a human being. Right. As, as a leader, et cetera, what your North star is in life. What is your calling? What is your purpose? Why are you here? What impact are you wanting to have? And to get really clear on that, um, because it'll be there anyway. You may just, but if you're not articulating it, then, then you're going to have less, less to work with in terms of knowing when you're in alignment and not out of alignment. But the symptoms of not being in alignment with your true values and your calling and your purpose, et cetera, are like, almost like spiritual ill being in a way, which can manifest as stress and anxiety and burnout and physical symptoms, et cetera. So getting very clear on that and then checking in with that often, like I do it through journaling and staying self-aware and self-reflective and self-critical and then, and then uh, sort of realigning, making your behaviors, how you're showing up, the decisions you're making, are they all in line with this? And if they are, then great. Then you can like, that's, that's, that's core. If that's not there, then it's going to be this general sense of dis-ease. So that's like the first bucket. Do you, and do you mind if I dive in there? Because I've written yeah, them down. So please. we'll definitely go through all four. Um, that speaks to me so <laughs> so loudly, like when you say that, because I remember people trying to tell me that early in my journey. Yeah. I could I could hear them, but I wasn't listening or the other way around. Yeah. For some reason, it wasn't getting through. I don't know if it's because I'd over-intellectualized this stuff. I thought I was some like highfalutin lawyer. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I didn't understand what it means to be living in line with my purpose and values. So it's like, yeah. I couldn't take the advice. Like, are you able to give some examples, at least for you, what, yeah. what, like what it means when you're in line and out of line, at least in your, ex you know, in your example. So that first time founders yeah. that are hearing our words, but not hearing the meaning. Yes. We're, we're still not going to get through to them, but let's try. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I can. I mean, there was a, period during Unmind where I started to 
I felt like I'd you know lost my mojo, become very I was like riddled with imposter syndrome, which is which can be a healthy thing, but but a lot of it's like degrading you and your capacity to show up well. Um, and I realized that it is because day to day I was not living my values. I wasn't playing to my strengths. I wasn't connected to my, let's call it my North Star. And I, I recognized that. Um, and so what I did was I, we may, we may not be able to do this, but I went to a, to a cabin in the woods for about three days. Really? Um, that, yeah, I did. It's, it's, I don't know what it is. Like with a long beard. and But um <laughs> In, a, in New Forest, and I, I took my, my journal with me, and I didn't use any technology, and I journaled and wrote and so on over those few days. And I, I did like an exercise where it's as if you're writing your, your uh, eulogy, what someone would be saying about you if you'd lived your life as well as you possibly could. I then wrote down what each of the most important people in my life would have said about me at, at my funeral, and I did a whole bunch of that kind of work. And out of that drew out my core values again and uh, what my North Star was. And then I – recommitted to making sure that I would stay connected to this and, and live in line with it. So what it looked like in practice for me was that then became just like a one pager. And and literally as a daily check in I could just give myself a score out of out of ten in terms of the way I've showed up today, the decisions I've made, etc. Are they in service of this in alignment with this? And if they were, you know, 10, 9, and if not, you know, I'd do a little bit journaling around that. And I would just um that would help me to course correct. That led to me changing my role that I'd mind. It, it, it led to me no longer trying to like focus on my weaknesses and fix my weaknesses and just play to my strengths. It led to some tangible things, which we can chat, chat about as well, but it helped me to reconnect with my, my spark and my mojo, right? So from a practical sense, that, that's what it looked like for me. That is amazing. Like, <laughs> I wish I'd done that rather than push myself right to the brink of sanity. <laughs> Sure, like, sure. And then and then stubbornly start looking for some of these 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 techniques. Um that's something you could recommend to anyone, right? All a founder needs to do is to to be humble enough and growth oriented enough to give it a go. They can spare a couple of sure. days to go somewhere and disconnect and really peer inwards. It's just then yeah. they just have to be willing to do it. But also, I mean, if if you can't do that and we all have varying circumstances, right? I mean, I do highly recommend just committing to a journaling practice. And that can be 10 minutes in the morning. Just you need to spend some time with yourself and almost like, because you, you're able to then engage with your higher self in a way. And I don't want to sound too flaky here, but no, but, I love but, it. But, but you are able to do that and you become self-reflective, self-aware. And I think that's, that's so important. You can get, you can get wrapped up in the day-to-day minutia if you don't take a bit of space and time to become self-aware. Right. So I would recommend journaling and like a self-reflection practice for sure. That's amazing, Steve. So then the next one, I think you used the word rest, restoration. Talk to me about yeah. that. Yeah, so like restoration, recovery, rest, et cetera. Like we live pretty full on lives. And as a, as a, as a founder, as a leader, you're going to be having a demanding day-to-day kind of life, right? And so rest and recovery is essential. The holy grail of that is, is sleep, right? Um, getting enough good quality sleep. Now, I say that as someone who spent a decade getting about two to three hours of sleep a night. So I had insomnia for 10 years of my life and I struggled oh. immensely because of it. I managed to overcome it and I'm now pretty well versed in all things sleep. And I've had the good for, you know, I've been a- able to chat with professors of sleep. And so like, I know quite a bit about sleep now and I've transformed my own sleep, but really like sleep needs to be a priority in your life. It has to be seen as that foundational thing in your life. If you don't have that, you can't build all the other good things on top of it, right? It's we all know what it feels like when we haven't got enough sleep. We are we're more irritable. We are less able to think well, to be creative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So sleep primary focus for me. And th- that has I've started to hear people talk more about that in recent years. But I have to say, for I'm 41. For most yeah. of my life, sleep, and particularly the co- the career I grew up in first corporate law. Yeah. Kind of not having sleep was almost like a badge of honor or of course, a path, of course. Of a sort of yeah, a, a, the path that you walk in order to earn the, the the promotion. It's interesting to hear you talk about it more the way an athlete would talk about sleep. You know, like you don't hear any professional sports people showing off about not sleeping. Of course, but business people in at least in prior generations, it was it was like a badge of honor, wasn't it? Hundred percent, and that that has shifted. But you used athlete there. I think it's a nice analogy. You need to think of yourself as an athlete. 
for your mind to be able to perform well. It, it needs sleep. It needs to not be stressed and burnt out all the time. And then there's a lot of good science to back that up. But yeah, think of yourself as an athlete. Rest and recovery is, is, is so important. Don't obsess about sleep, but prioritize sleep. <laughs> Obsessing can, yeah, can lead to the opposite effect, right? But I'm just con- relatively consistent sleep times, um, avoiding bright lights in the evening, um, general healthy lifestyle, wind down period before bed, all those things you've heard like, oh, yeah, yeah, same old, same old, but it works. It works, right? Um, but I would say prioritize sleep is essential. And then during the day, just giving yourself – some moments for active recovery, really important. Otherwise, with the same analogy of an athlete in mind, your performance will just go down and down and down as the day progresses. If you have little periods of active recovery, you can have high performance rest and high performance rest. You can have constant capacity to think well, to focus, to get into deep work and flow. If not, you're just going to become less capable as the day goes on. So rest and recovery is super important. That's like the second priority, I'd say, underneath fulfillment. And the next one I think you said was movement, right? Yeah, movement. I mean, I have to remind myself, you know, we're in, we're in front of our laptops a lot. But when, when we <laughs> sit in front of, we're sitting down all day, we, we stagnate quite literally. Like our, our blood doesn't pump as much. Like our blood pumps around the body through leg movement, right? So even if you got up from your desk every hour and just did 10 squats in your office or whatever it might be, like that is going to help you to start thinking better again, to feel more energized, to get rid of excess cortisol in the body. Whatever movement looks like for you. For me, for me, it's walks in the woods with my dog. It's gym a few times during the week. Um, yeah, essential that we, that we move as often as we can, really. Yeah, m- makes sense. And I feel like that's the one people know about, but maybe yeah. just aren't, aren't, aren't um, disciplined about, about yeah. ensuring that they get it into their, for sure. their regime. And we'll talk about some of the things that blow us off course of these. And I think you said, do you say hydration? And like, I was going to say nutrition, to hydration. Nutrition. Love- Tell you about that. Now, before the I get there, the movement one, one thing that it's worth noting is that if, you are, if you're super stressed out and you're feeling burnt out, uh, et cetera, doing hardcore exercise is probably not the right thing to be doing. Because you're just going to be right. adding further stress to an already stressed out body and it could put you into a catabolic state, could break down muscle tissue, aches and pains. So if that's what you're experiencing, stuff like, yoga tai chi stretching that's probably a better thing and then get your sleep back on track and then ah. you need to have energy to expel energy otherwise you're just like pouring your fuel out the tank kind of thing so just i thought i'd mention that as well yeah actually and now i think about it i played rugby growing up i i enjoyed functional fitness and yeah. i was doing a lot of functional fitness in some of the more high stress periods um I think it was a net benefit, but you're right. I, I didn't spend a lot of time doing kind of active recovery type yeah. um, type exercise because I, I just wasn't considered about how all of these things go to go together, course. really. I it was I was always like, let's just muscle through this quarter and then I'll fix all the, the yeah, know, sure. bur- burning pile of dung that is the rest of my life once I've fixed the business. <laughs> <laughs> for sure, for sure. Um, but it's so important that we... If we approach this in a in a more consistent way, and the stuff we've spoken about doesn't need to be uh, huge amounts of time dedicated. It can require relatively short amounts of time, but it's keeping you. It's, it's it helps you to, to sustain performance rather than just smash it out, break down, and have to like build up slowly over time. Like it's it's counterproductive, right? So the sooner we can embed these kinds of habits into our lives, the better. Um, makes m- makes sense and I, i'm assuming the same sort of philosophy continues for the nutrition side of things right yeah i mean i'm not going to i won't go into too much detail there i mean i think a nice uh heuristic is just eat real food you know we can get we can get wrapped up and should it be keto should it be this should it be that we're all different it's something called biochemical individuality we all have a different gut we have food impacts us in different ways but one thing is for sure like the less processed food you eat the better so just focus on if you're a meat eater like you know, healthy grass-fed meat, ideally, but, you know, meat and lots of fruit and vegetables and nuts and just real food, really. That's what I could say. Steve, do you get pissed off with people that can't, won't listen or just can't discipline themselves to do these things in their own best interest? Like my confession is since I learned the entrepreneurial operating system and the kind of like the the how to run a small business in, 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 a, in an effective way, 
Mm. I've got like a lot of colleagues that teach EOS as well. And the ones that I think are better than me are the ones that are like natural coaches. They don't get annoyed. Like I still have an operator's spirit. The, the organizations I connect best with, I think actually quite like my impatience. But when I'm being reflective, I, I admire people that are more like, like have like a God given talent for coaching where they never get annoyed with and never give up on anyone. Sure. Does that make sense? But like, what? Because oh, like, no, yeah, of course. Once I've kind of seen the light as to what I think the right way to do something is, I find it very difficult to be endlessly patient with somebody that I care about. Right? I want these founders to have fulfilling lives, run successful businesses, not end up with stress-induced lack of skin pigmentation. You know, and <laughs> and then they yeah. don't fucking and then they don't fucking listen. <laughs> I hear you. So I hear you. Um, I am. All- <laughs> I am also a coach, so I typically take a more coaching approach to how I might engage with people. Now I'm okay. just sharing, I'm sharing information because I, I know the information, but how I might work with a person, I think it's, it's better for someone to come up with something for themselves. They're far more likely to commit to it. And I understand why it's difficult. We're just, we're just overflowing with information, information. Like it can become overwhelming. So it's why I listed those things in, in order, like focus on one thing first. Once you've got it down, it's like a, a habit that's easy in your life and move on to the next thing. Um, so no, I don't, I don't get frustrated necessarily. It's, you know, it's, it's a tough world that we just, it's, it's pretty overwhelming, but I think it's important for whatever those ideas are to come from you. You know, there needs to be your own personal agency involved. So, yeah. Why do you think so few founders, like let's start mm-hmm. with the first one. Why do you think it is that so few founders, uh, at least in my experience, yours might be different. Yeah are able to or take the time to, to to make sure that what they're doing with their days, make sure that they're doing in their company is configured in a way that's consistent with who they are at the core. Is it is it just ignorance? I mean, I didn't know. Was yeah, I sure. I, I learned this after I started. Yeah, I mean, who knows? I mean, I don't want to use the word ignorance in a like derogatory term. It might literally be like literal not knowing some of the information or let's say yeah. all the, the links between doing it and not doing it and, and the impact that might have on your health and well-being, your capacity performance. It might be ignorance to that degree, right? But it's also, I think, well, I mean, if we're going to get deeper here, I think it's at the root, it's, it's a flawed paradigm that we use to look at ourselves and our work and our organizations. We use a mechanistic lens to look at ourselves, like machine inputs and outputs. And, but we're not. We're, we're living, breathing human beings that are part of living, breathing organizations that we can't just push, push, push. It's not input, output. It's, it's not just about efficiency and that, you know, we, we have certain intrinsic needs as human beings that must be met for us to be healthy, well, perform well, et cetera. Like, so I think it comes down to a flawed way of seeing it. And that's because the machine mindset's pervasive, right? It's, yes. it's it was born in the industrial revolution and it's, it's hung around for a long time. So it's just because it's the way that people do things. And we, just get stuck in it, I guess. So this, again, would require a bit of stepping back, self-awareness, self-reflection, seeing things for as they are. I do think a bit of uh, understanding the science behind high performance and that won't, won't harm you. you know, I think understanding and then recognizing, ah, so when I'm stressed and burnt out, I literally am like operating at like 30% of the potential that I could be operating at. Like when you start to understand that, then you've got some motivation to change as well. But I do think it's the wrong paradigm that might be driving these kinds of behaviors forgetting that we're human (laughs) yeah i think that's right it's interesting i I think if if i think about what's spoken to me um i would love it if i would love to i I like the idea of being the type of person that just kind of receives these things because i've just got this kind of innate wisdom if i'm honest i think some of it's sort of my competitive spirit that has led me in this way i've got this weird thing where i've become more and more zen and yogi like as I've got more and more serious about having a successful life, like broadly defined. Mm. And Mm. now I I truly believe in this as a vehicle to success, the broadly defined, including economically. And so I think I liked the way you defined ignorance. It may well be actually that those folks that have grown up trying to be, get into the best school, then get into the best company and then start the best company backed by the best investors and to get the best traction Actually, I think as they start, you know, because of missions like the one that you've been on with Unmind, as they start to learn more about these things and realize that actually 
a lot of this stuff that would have felt a bit hippy dippy 20 years ago, maybe yeah, is sure, actually sure. entirely consistent with trying to behave like a, like an athlete, which whilst recognizing our bodies are not machines, there is a slightly kind of the way athletes think about their bodies and the inputs and outputs almost is trying to control what they can control, right? Recognizing sure. there's a lot they can't control. For sure. hundred percent. I think I, I like that way of thinking about it, but it, and to your point of hippy dippy, et cetera, um, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm embedded in a very science-driven space, science-driven organization, like science is important. And there is a whole bunch of stuff out there that cannot re- be reduced down to just like, like again, like I said, inputs and outputs in science alone. And and um, whether you call that soul, whether you call that spirit, like I think seeing a lot of what we're talking about through that lens is important. Like you can't divorce your role as a founder from your life. You can't divorce your work from your life. Like it is all just your life. And like, that's why it's almost like these bigger questions are, should be the ones that we, that help uh, trickle down into the rest of this. Like what type of life do you want to live? What type of person do you want to be? What impact do you want to have, et cetera, et cetera. When you really get clear on that and you, and you like connect with that, then I, I can't help but think that the behaviors will like naturally shift and to me i call that soul and spirit but you don't have to call it that you can call it purpose you can call it mission whatever but i think if we become too uh, myopic and just think of our roles as like the, this, these little things unto themselves or our, our organizations thing unto themselves and, and forget that they're part of this only life we have then then i think we we get stuck in like habitual unhelpful behaviors so taking like a bigger perspective i think is, is helpful yeah, it's super inspiring. Have you got a couple of minutes to talk about the organizational culture stuff? Because I, yeah, I just sure. you said something a little earlier. I think it's really interesting. Sure. Did you, I don't want to put words in your mouth, did, but did you find then that as you sort of focused on individuals and helping them find balance, success, sustainable, high performance, it was sort of hitting a ceiling of the organizational environments that they found themselves in, which almost forced you to sort of broaden the mission and your contribution. I would love to understand what you've kind of learned about yeah organizational environments and uh, mm. um i mean the people listening to this might be founders that are thinking about creating environments but we also have people that listen that are entrepreneurial minded but are currently employees somewhere and yes. part of the reason they might be wanting to pure, pursue, pursue entrepreneurship is because they may actually be in an unhealthy place internally or externally currently so i think your sure. your observations on organizational culture and how it goes to some For of sure. these things would be really interesting for sure. Yeah, I could speak that about this from different perspectives, but the first one would be uh, just within Unmind itself and how we've approached what we do. We focused on employees initially, on supporting employees, which is really important. Um, but we rec- recognize, and I, I, I'm trying to think where the, what this arose out of. I don't know if it arose out of necessarily thinking they'd hit a ceiling or anything like that. It was more just just like a, like a light bulb kind of, moment i guess and actually driven by uh, something called the biopsychosocial model but i don't need to go into that necessarily <laughs> but we we realized that you could give your employee all the support that you could give them um you know an eap therapists whatever it might be but if they are within an organizational culture that is there's incivility and, and toxicity and, and poor leadership and management practices you can only do so much for that employee to be healthy and well because the environment that you're in is so important. A lot of the problems we experience arise out of our environment. And so we shifted from just focusing on the individual to also focusing on the organization as a whole and helping organizations understand how to create cultures that better support mental health and well-being. So very briefly, like we look at stuff like trust and leadership, management support, psychological safety, and so on and so on, right? And we help organizations improve across those. Um, but what's also the other perspective I can come from it is actually just within, within unmind itself, like culture is really important. Like to me, if you're a, if you're a founder and you've got a a startup, like you should be thinking about culture from, from day one and be very Mm -hmm. intentional about the culture you're wanting to help allow flourish. Right. Um, I guess our culture started somewhat organically, but because we were hiring for passion fit and purpose fit and all the rest initially, we, we, we were able to have a lot of alignment between like our mission and our culture. Like we wanted a culture that right. was, was good for people's mental health and well-being. Right now, as we've grown over the years and, you know, venture capital backed, growing, growing expectations, short-term results, expectations and so on. 
it becomes very difficult to hold that tension between the expectations from being a venture capital backed company in a tough market that's growing fast and one of the you know fastest growing tech scalers and all the rest with being a company that's mission driven and wanting work to be good for well being it's a it's a tough it's a right. tough um tension to hold however for us to achieve our mission we want we need to be as high performing as possible right um and so for us it was a journey of recognizing fine this is not about doing away with the need to to achieve short term results but we it has to be a both and thing and the, and the and is we need a culture where people can flourish in because that becomes good for the individual good for business right and so we've been very intentional about holding this tension acknowledging this tension um and and making sure that how we were showing up with each other across all the levels of the organization across teams was uh conducive to flourishing right and so we our values align with that our values are be human that's one of our core values um we've got a few others i ended up running a, a cultural assessment across the whole organization so we can bring awareness to this like we take it very seriously you, you don't need to do it how i've done it but the point i'm trying to get across is that you need to take this seriously because if you don't then your culture can just degrade in the direction of whatever stress takes it right it, it's it's important is, is my point Totally. And um, Steve, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will, will have been as inspired as, as I am. Like, what's the smallest type of company that's a, that's a realistic, like a good fit client for, for, for an unmind? Um, and no one will be offended if, if, if yeah. your average customer is a lot bigger than the average listener here. But if folks cool. are interested, like what, what's, what's, a, what's usually a good fit to, to actually come and consider working with unmind? Yeah, so we, we typically work with larger organizations, a minimum of like 1,000 employees, but most of our organizations are a fair bit larger. So it's normally a sort of enterprise organizations. So where would you recommend that somebody that's running an organization, you know, 10 to the very biggest ones, a couple of hundred people, where, are there any particular resources that you typically recommend a founder going to to, 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 um, to try and get themselves into best in class across some of the things that you've mentioned here? Mm. Um. In terms of culture, there's something called the Okai, which is Organizational Cultural Assessment Inventory. But there's a book written about it. Helps you understand different cultural types and the degree to which your organization might uh, be manifesting each of them. And then it really can walk you through how to um, understand that and embed cultural change in organization. I think that's really important. Um, oh, there's lots. As from an individual perspective, this is maybe getting a little bit philosophical, but I, I think love Martin, Martin Buber's I and Thou, in terms of, I think that can be a good resource for how you show up as a founder in your startup. I and Thou is all about either looking at people through the lens of utility or looking at them through the lens of, of Thou, right, of a fellow human being. And we, it's quite easy to shift towards the uh, the former when you're under stress and so on, but really important that we stay in this I vow relationship. There are many. I mean, I've got I've got loads of books all over my house, but th- those come to mind from a culture, a big organizational thing, and then individual. Amazing. And are you happy for me to put a link to your LinkedIn? And I know you can't answer everybody that's pinging you every random question, sure. but you're happy for people to sort of follow you if they're interested in this yeah, space. Of course. Maybe they aspire to have a thousand employees one day, and they might be able to get on the online customer roster. Of course, of course. Cool. Brilliant, Steve. Thank you so much. This has been amazing. Of course, Rob. Thanks, man. It's been a pleasure.